Hi, Andy. Hi, Victoria. Today, we will have Rebecca Abraham, who is a nurse who specializes in cannabis nursing. I, I did not know there was such a thing as cannabis nursing, and I'm looking forward to hearing what she has to say. And I'm really looking forward to diving deep into how do we figure out the best combination mm -hmm. of CBD, THC, best way to offer it to the patient. So let's get her on. Okay. Rebecca Abraham is board certified in critical care nursing and certified in cannabis nursing through the American Association of Cannabis Nurses. She educates physicians, nurses, patients, and the cannabis industry on the science, safety, and potential therapeutic uses of cannabis. She is the president and founder of Acute on Chronic, which is the first cannabis nurse clinic in the Midwest. In 2015, she was awarded the Illinois Nurses Association 40 Under 40 Leaders in Nursing Award. Welcome, Rebecca. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. It's interesting that as of 2023, 37 states have legalized cannabis for medical purposes. And there are 3.6 million users of medical cannabis in the U.S. But, and this is a big but, there's a lot of confusion about dosing cannabis. And your business set out to remedy that problem. I would really love if you could tell our listeners about the service that you offer. Yes, I'm happy to. And thank you for having me. So as a critical care nurse, I would have people and patients, their families, um, over the last decade, even prior to legalization, ask about medical cannabis. How can I use this? I heard this can help. Um, a lot of things in medicine, as you know, um, things that are chronic, chronic pain, um, dementia, delirium, migraines, anything where we truly can't fix, and that is ongoing. Um, we're not really great um, as an entire system of fixing that. So um, when people come up and hit that wall in the current system we have, oftentimes that's where people start considering medical cannabis um, and recreational cannabis. Um, so I had been getting questions my whole career. Um, my husband's a physician. My friends are physicians. They were getting questions and they did not know what to tell people. They didn't really want to talk about it because because of what their employer could say, as well as they didn't really feel comfortable sending folks just to dispensaries. Um, mm -hmm. Some doctors had told me uh, that they had done that and they regretted it after because patients would come back with like horrible stories about how they were given 400 milligrams of THC and they were high for days, um, but their pain was not fixed. Um, mm -hmm. So I had saw a problem. Um, I was very interested in medical cannabis. And so I said, this seems like a problem nursing could easily solve uh, in the ICU. I am the one who decides how much life support they get or not. So for those of you not in medicine, um, when you are in the ICU, uh, typically the doctor says, this person, person is very sick. They need life support. Nurse, it's up to you to choose which life support at the dose that they're getting. Just look at their vitals. And so this is a skill. Cannabis is very similar um, and comparable to things like critical care nursing, as well as diabetes education nursing and wound nursing. There are, are things that nurses do um, typically for treatments that are not based in pharmacology, um, that are more alternative, but definitely non-pharmacological um, things are our wheelhouse, as well as medications that take a long time to titrate um, and figure out what the patient needs. And I thought, well, this seems very much the same as that. So I set out as an ICU nurse to hire other nurses, uh, create a scalable model based in nursing methodology and nursing theory um, that helps the patients. And so we had a couple of trial runs with this before we launched, just patients looking for advice to see if we could create something that worked. And it does. Um, so currently, um, I'm always tracking our statistics. Um, nine out of 10 
of our patients, when they finish the program, they will have mild to complete symptom resolution. Um, I can at least promise some sort of change and some sort of range to the symptomology that they're experiencing. Um, what we do is we interview the patient, we do a nursing assessment, we then do a complete re lit review, and then we create our care plan based in nursing methodology. Um, and then we see that patient a couple more times to increase or decrease uh, their cannabis. And we collaborate with their physician and their medical team to talk to them about what pharmaceuticals perhaps should be decreased or other signs and symptoms that we're seeing the patient experience through a therapeutic nursing relationship or um, side effects that maybe the patient may be having and how to mitigate those. Well, that's a lot. So it's we're going <laughs> to unpack some of that. Um, yes. I think just let's start by saying there's so many different ways to ingest cannabis. Uh, there are gummies, there are tinctures, there are brownies, you can smoke it, you can aerosolize it, uh, lollipops. There's just so many different um, possibilities. How do you work with a client to figure out the best product, the best mode of consumption for them? Yeah. The nursing assessment tells us quite a bit. We ask the patient and client what they're comfortable with. We see what's available in their market. Uh, hemp, so your CBD, uh, which I think everybody has heard of, that is actually available in all 50 states. So if I find a really good modality uh, let's say you hate MCT oil, I can find a producer that has good lab reports, responsible farming, and I could recommend that product to the patient and say, I have this really great other manufacturer that cold presses the hemp oil. This is safe for you. Um, a little bit of what the patient wants and then what the literature says that we should be doing. Uh, we are pulling from global literature. Nurses do a lot of things on gut feelings. That's really hard to describe, but, um, a lot of our care is really driven by our gut. That is kind of the difference between a great nurse and a good nurse is the guts on the inside. Mm -hmm. As well as now that we have more and more patients, we can actually pull from our data and see, okay, we have an 80-year-old female with chronic pain. Uh, what happened for that subgroup of patients? What worked best? And we take knowledge from what we know before, from the patient, from the literature review, and create this nursing care plan where we essentially act as their guide. What's really nice about this is there is a therapeutic relationship. Uh, the patient gets time to talk about their chronic illness or acute illness. A lot of things in healthcare, uh, very kind of, you know, do as I say, and if you don't, mm, you're going to be in chronic, you're going to have pain. Um, cannabis nursing is not like that. We give the patient options. We give them dosing ranges and we tell the patient, um, you know, this is, you are the driver of this bus. What are you comfortable with? Are you somebody who is organized and you are meticulous and you're okay with taking something three times a day or are you forgetful? Um, we meet them where they're at. Um, and that I think is, a lot of it's I think there's a multiple components of how we have success with cannabis and using cannabis uh, more as a supplement that is a medication uh, and why we have seen some success with cannabis, but not uh, not the same success that my company is having when people just kind of sort of try this out on their own and, and wing it, essentially. Andy. As a botanist and someone who has studied um, cannabis for many years, what's your sense of the advantages and disadvantages of the different methods of consumption or ingestion? You know, Victoria, it's not just different methods of consumption. It's that cannabis has such a complex chemistry. Mm -hmm. And we really don't know the actions of all these different components separately mm -hmm. or together. And there's so many different products out there with different composition. There are mm -hmm. different strains of cannabis with different effects. And on top of that, there is great individuality of response to cannabis. You know, there are people who can smoke pot before bedtime and they fall asleep yeah. easily. And other people, if they do that, they can't get to sleep at all. So I, that, I think that makes it rather difficult to use as a medication. It's a unique product. And I don't think we yet know uh, all we need to know in order to tell patients how to select a particular type of cannabis, you know, let alone the method of ingestion. It's just like, it's complicated. 
And one of the reasons for this is it's scheduled because it hasn't been um, legal to study the therapeutic uses of cannabis. Yeah. And let's remember, it is in Schedule 1 at the federal right. level, which mean, is defined as substances with high abuse potential and no therapeutic potential. Right. And I'm wondering, Rebecca, does that create any obstacles for you, that federal prohibition? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, because when we look at what the schedules are, um, just to put it in perspective, um, you know, fentanyl, very popular in the right. media. A lot of, lot of wrong information happening yep. in the world about fentanyl. Um, fentanyl morphine is Schedule II. Uh, benzodiazepines, so for those out there, that's your Xanax. Your Ativan, your Lorazepam is Schedule IV. And schedule Highly four, addictive. Barely on and, the... And barely very on the dangerous and very dangerous. Exactly. Yeah. Um, when we look at the safety profile of cannabis and everything you said is true, it's yeah. complicated. And that is what the cannabis industry is really missing. Um, they keep trying to pack it in this box and put a bow on it. And if you want science to take this seriously, if you want medicine to engage, um, it is not in a box. It is quite complicated. And my prediction is it's probably going to be its own specialty, if mm -hmm. not maybe housed in some place like palliative care. Mm. Um, so I wish cannabis uh, would be descheduled to something much, much, much lower. Um, because if you look at the safety profile, it's you, there are side effects, there are downsides. But if you compare them to things like um, your ibuprofen, your um, your Xanax, um, it's safer. There's, uh, I, I would go farther than that, Rebecca. Yeah. You can't kill people with cannabis. There are no reported deaths from cannabis and there's no drug that we use in medicine, which does not have a lethal potential. So it's totally irrational that scheduling. And, Absolutely. and I hope a lot of people are working on getting it out of there. Can I ask you, yeah. what is the American Association of Cannabis Nurses? I'm unfamiliar yes. with it. So the American uh, Cannabis Nurse Association is a group of nurses, uh, first generation nurses who came together and said, this should really be a specialty. This is absolutely belongs in nursing. Um, so what they did is they now are working to get recognized by the ANA, the American Nurses Association, and we are. So uh -huh. good job to that board. Great. And of course, um, we are working on a board, like a true board certification. To be a certified cannabis nurse, we will have a test takes a long, long time to get. I think hospice nurses just got their test. So hospice mm -hmm. nursing created in a very similar way. Doctors didn't want to touch it in the 60s. Um, they said it was the family's job. And a nurse from the UK said, no, uh, this, is, this is absolutely nursing. You've mentioned uh, nursing process a few times. And um, I know uh, from our prior conversation, one of the things that you do is you work on a care plan and setting goals. Um, can you speak about that in terms of recommending cannabis products to a client? Yeah. So essentially, a nursing care plan is how all nurses learn how to be nurses. It teaches us to think as nurses, where I talked about guts. That's where that is. Cannabis is a very strange gray area. Um, it's not prescribed. It's recommended. Mm -hmm. There's no standardized dosing. You can't die. Um, and nobody's really taken responsibility. Is it a food? Is it a supplement? Is it a medicine? This is where it gives a lot of room for nurses to touch this and, and do the education with it because um, no doctor is writing a prescription for cannabis, not plant mm -hmm. cannabis. Now there is Marinol, yeah. um, right. you know, Sativex, Epidiolex. Right. Those right. are prescribed right. pharmaceutical synthetics. Um, we're not recommending those. We're not prescribing those. Um, so that's not nursing. Uh, but I was like, how do I do this work, get accepted by physicians mm -hmm. and stay in my lane? Um, and the nursing care plan is that modality, um, mm -hmm. totally rooted in nursing science, goal setting, mm -hmm. um, assessment, education, reassess. Um, what's even better about that is not only does this allow us to do our work, but patients love it because it gives them back that choice. I talk to people who have had chronic pain for 20 years and they're like, I, you mean I get like, they're, they're shocked. Like <laughs> I have a choice. I could choose any of these. 
these five products you've listed, I could, I could make my choice. Yes, you can make your own choice. Um, they're shocked by that. And, um, it really does build that therapeutic relationship, um, that helps the patient do this in a safe way because you can't die. And we're working a little bit backwards. Um, there's reasons why we do that. Just like you said, many pharmaceuticals are, have a lethal potential, even water, um, cannabis, it, if you overdid cannabis, you wouldn't die. If you overdid water, you would. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, kind of a strange phenomenon there, for sure. Uh, there's a safety mechanism built in when we're doing pharmaceuticals. With cannabis, you can't die. So how are my nurses, how are my physicians, how are we building science in cannabis? Um, all nursing is done through practice-based evidence. You know, I drive around my community, which is Tucson, Arizona, and I see people waving signs that say CBD here. <laughs> and um, um, CBD, as you said, is legal in all 50 states, but it may not be the ideal product for most people. Um, in fact, um, the evidence suggests that you do need a combination of CBD and THC and uh, maybe many other of the complex set of ingredients that are in the plant. Um, how do you decide what percent THC, uh, whether um, you're using one form of cannabis uh, or another? Uh, you know, get us into some of the practicalities. So the way we pick it really depends on the patient. It depends on what pharmaceuticals they're on, what supplements they're on. Is there an interaction? Are they immunocompromised? What do they want to use it for? What route of administration are they comfortable with? What route of administration is beneficial to them? Mm -hmm. um, diet, age, um, tolerance. Some people lack an enzyme. Some people hypermetabolize things. So sometimes I get clues through tramadol actually gives me a clue. Um, this has not been studied, but this is a little bit of some nursing gut work. Um, when people hypermetabolize tramadol, um, most of the time they will hypermetabolize cannabis too. Just what I've noticed from working with patients. Um, I wish somebody would do this study to help understand it. Um, 23andMe, if they've done that and I see that their liver is noted to hypermetabolize, I know that they're going to clip through something like an edible quite fast. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no patient is truly the same. So some things that make me avoid CBD actually is a big one. Um, a common misconception is people think THC is the most dangerous cannabinoid. No, it gives you the most side effects uh, and has the potential for the most uncomfortable side effects. But CBD is actually the one I worry about and the one most physicians and patients don't worry about. And it's because the uh, drug interaction is not completely understood. Um, CBD seems to interact with more than THC does um, and a little bit a little bit in scary ways. I would love to see a study done particularly on CBD and the interaction with Plavix. Um, and Plavix for those who are listening is a blood thinner and if you need a blood thinner to work for you to prevent for example a stroke say you have you have atrial fibrillation uh, you don't want it to be metabolized too quickly and get out of your system yeah um so when i started working with patients physicians started sending us folks um and when i looked up drug interactions i used three databases that we commonly use in the hospital and in the outpatient uh setting and and I did not see anything on Plavix for a long time, even though all of these things are metabolized in the liver. But I didn't see a reaction until July of 2020. Um, late July, I saw cannabis, particularly CBD, can decrease the circulating amount of Plavix, the thinning of the blood. That's not good um, because we want people to get the full dose of that medication. And then a doctor that I work with called me in, in August and said, did you see this study where people are having repeat heart attacks with cannabis? What say you? And I immediately thought of the Plavix. So just to explain this to the audience, uh, when you have a heart attack, you go to a place called cath lab most of the time. And what they do there is they put a stent in. So it is a metal 
sheath and they open it up. The metal sheath stays in the arteries. Blood flow is returned. To prevent our body from clotting and attacking that stent, so the metal in our heart, we give people Plavix to keep the blood thin from platelets, keep it moving through. If you are a cannabis user and you just got that placed and you are decreasing that medicine, you are likely to have a heart attack again. As legalization in CBD became mainstream, we saw an uptick of these cardiac and uh, events, strokes, heart attacks increasing. I would love to see if this is uh, concurrent with people just on Plavix, on Coumadin, another blood thinner that CBD affects. Um, was this affected by the mass use and lack of understanding of CBD? Um, what I have good, so the good news and bad news is with us working with physicians and more of us educating and being out there, um, these are manageable things. You know, currently we recommend if you've had a heart attack within the last year, um, you're going to need that Plavix therapy. Call us after the year is done. We'll talk to your cardiologist, see if you want to go forward. Um, as long as people know, um, it's controllable with warfarin, another blood thinner that CBD actually increases the amount of. Um, as long as you're getting your labs checked and you're going in frequently and you're seeing what your levels are, you can use CBD. We just have to know. So uh, I don't think cannabis is necessarily a hard stop here with these interactions. I just think that we have to spread knowledge and there has to be um, informed folks involved. Um, and the patient has to have informed consent. Um, another interaction with CBD is birth control. Um, informed consent is very important there because sure, you should absolutely use CBD con to control your anxiety um, if you are a woman of childbearing age, um, but you absolutely probably want to know if it's going to uh, interact with your birth control. So, Yeah, those are some important interactions. And I know that's one of the things that your company offers by doing the literature review and looking specifically at any cannabis medicine um, interactions that may occur. Um, you know, it's such an interesting time. Uh, Reuters suggests that 4% of baby boomers are using cannabis medicinally. And uh, those of us of a certain age will remember that film, Reefer Madness, <laughs> that suggested if you use cannabis, you could get addicted and you could get yourself in trouble. How common is addiction? Um, Andy, is this something that people using medicinal cannabis have to worry about? I don't think there's true addiction with cannabis, but there can certainly be dependence. You know, it can be an unproductive habit. Uh, among many people, it really doesn't benefit you. And some people have difficulty separating themselves from it. But I would not call it true addiction in the way that alcohol and, and tobacco and opioids are addictive. And it used to be called a gateway drug, which <laughs> suggested once you um, began to use marijuana, cannabis, you'd go on to uh, more potent uh, forms of mind altering substances. I was really surprised in 2019, there was a large study out of Canada that showed that their registered cannabis users, and they track it carefully in Canada at the federal level, actually reduce their use of opioids and benzodiazepines, uh, suggesting that it's actually the reverse of a gateway medicine. It, it reverses the likelihood you're going to get yourself into trouble. I don't think there's any quality of any drug that leads users to go to, you know, a different class of drugs. If there's anything that's a gateway drug in our society, it's alcohol. You know, that's that is the first psychoactive drug that most people, young people use. So where do you think as an integrative medicine um, physician and educator that cannabis is most useful? Well, let me say, you know, I think it's great that the nursing profession has taken this up because I don't think physicians are going to do it yet. And the reason is that 
uh, physicians would need to see a cannabis preparation that looks to them like a familiar pharmaceutical. And there aren't any out there. Uh, Rebecca mentioned Sativex, which is a, a made in the UK, and that is a whole cannabis extract. I think it's a very good preparation, and it looks like a medical drug, and doctors would be comfortable, I think, using it, but the FDA will not allow it in this country. Um, you know, I think that's just stupid. But if we had a preparation like that, uh, I believe more doctors would feel comfortable comfortable uh, recommending or prescribing cannabis at the moment i think they're they're confused and don't feel comfortable you know recommending the things that are out there in dispensaries but if nurses can do that i think that's a great way to make it available to patients i agree with everything you said going all the <laughs> way back to cannabis use disorder yeah it it doesn't really exist the study done on it was in 2015 prior to legalization in most states. And we have to think about who is answering that yep. question, right? There are already people who are open in an illegal time to disclosing cannabis use. Um, I could bet money that there were a ton more people in the population using cannabis, but they were like, oof, I'm not admitting that. Um, it, that study came out to about 10%. I bet if we re redid that study today, it would fall. And I agree. I, there's no chemical addiction that we've ever, ever, ever seen. Um, the mortality when you have a dispensary, uh, each dispensary in each county in the United States, your mortality from opioid addiction falls by 12 to 16%. So it's wow. the opposite of a gateway drug, um, decreases polypharmacy in older folks. Mm -hmm. um, we actually see, yeah, it's, it's, it is the anti-drug, which is really interesting after all we've seen in the last um, 80 years. And I completely agree that doctors um, do not want and probably will continue to not want much to do with cannabis. And I, and the reason is, is let's say that, you know, it falls off the scheduling. It's completely legal. Everybody can do what they want now. Hospital policies open it up. The problem is it's a time consuming and titratable supplement to get right. And doctors, particularly in the United States in this model, they don't have time in that encounter to keep counseling people on cannabis care. Um, that's why diabetics are sent to diabetes educator nurses. They don't have the time in a 20 minute encounter. Um, I keep seeing people in the cannabis space, innovators keep coming up with apps for doctors to use, website for doctors to use. And I laugh because doctors don't have time for that. <laughs> They're just trying to get in just the basics of what they need for charting and assessing and diagnosing and prescribing. Um, so they will not have time to do these things. So the absolutely, I think as this grows, nurses are the solution. Um, and I compare it to therapy. Um, you can't go to therapy in one day and get the results you want. Therapy works for many, many things, and we see that in the literature, but you know you can't see one therapist one time and, and be solved of all of your trauma, um, and everybody's different. You sent me a couple of abstracts about case studies where people had really, I would say, remarkable outcomes. Uh, one was a woman with Alzheimer's who had uh, agitation and um, maybe delirium, and you were able to put together uh, several different cannabis products that dramatically improved her status. And the other was for someone who had uh, uncontrollable, restless legs, uh, extreme difficulty sleeping that was not solved by any of our conventional medicines. It, that's exciting to see. It's always exciting to see when we can find uh, solutions to difficult problems. Rebecca, where else do you think cannabis is going to turn out to be a solution to some of our difficult medical problems? So I was actually just talking to my hospitalist husband today. Mm -hmm. um, he was telling me the story of um, he knows a rheumatologist, like a friend of a friend, who was complaining about we don't understand fibromyalgia and how the heck did rheumatology get stuck treating fibromyalgia because nobody knows how to treat it. And we were talking about how doctors 
even some palliative doctors and rheumatolo rheumatologists do not like chronic pain. Be be and neurologists don't either because mm -hmm. you essentially diagnose people with bad news and say, I'm sorry, I can't fix it. And that could be really, you know, for nurses and doctors, we came here to help people and it could get frustrating, especially over years of not being able to treat something with anything we have available. Um, and I said, I love treating pain. I love palliative. And he said, yeah, you love it because you found something that makes people get better. <laughs> so you're ahead of them because if you saw people not getting better, like you did in the ICU, you would absolutely hate it. Um, and so I think chronic pain is huge, um, where cannabis mm -hmm. can truly make a difference in a safe way because you use ibuprofen, uh, your NSAIDs enough over the course of 20 years, and you're going to have some real side effects from that. Opioids, we already know of their problems. Cannabis is a solution that can absolutely be a long-term idea. Dementia and delirium is something that is very, very promising, I think, next to chronic pain and could not only improve the quality of life of millions of people and their caregivers, but actually be quite the cost savings for the entire healthcare system as a whole. Um, the study you'd mentioned, uh, the case study we did was on a patient in their home. Um, we actually can replicate that in facilities as well. Mm -hmm. So in our case series that we're doing, um, we've actually had two patients in facilities that also did quite well. Um, so we have seen this both outpatient and in essentially. And just to think about the quality of life for everyone that improves. Um, mm -hmm. Currently delirium in the hospital, our choices are horrible and awful for everyone. Restraints, both physical and chemical, Continuous nursing is often required. Continuous family monitoring, that's really hard um, for families and even in facilities, even in the ICU. Yeah. More than one patient, hard to watch. With the infusion of cannabis, CBD, um, these other modalities, um, patients are much, much, much calmer. They are sleeping. Their circadian rhythm seems to regulate. Um, they seem to be in less pain. Even our nonverbal patients that we've looked at, um, they are not, you know, yelping in pain anymore. They are much more happy, smiling more, less moaning, moving more, more exercise is being done, PT, so really cool stuff. So I think um, difficult to treat things, uh, chronic illness, chronic pain, uh, dementia, delirium, and anxiety, I, I think are going to be the biggest uses. I do think there's a future for adjunctive therapy in cannabis with oncology. So that's cancer. What does adjunctive mean? Um, we see really cool results with cannabis when used for symptom control in patients with cancer who are getting chemotherapy and radiation. Um, sometimes we also see in test tubes and animals and some of these patients that we're looking at after, um, they're having a little bit of better outcomes. Um, these results are buried mixed, um, but I, I have a feeling with more research, um, if we include cannabis care with oncology care, um, I feel like we're going to see a lot of really interesting and cool things in the future. Rebecca, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. We really appreciate it. Great. Thank you so much. So yeah, lots of really neat things out there. Um, we are just in the beginning of this. And I know some of my um, some of my guesses are going to be wrong in the future, but I think some of them are going to be very right. And I'm really excited to see. But so far, what we see looks great. And it's, I tell you, coming from the ICU where many, many people did not get better to coming to a place where they do, uh, when they never thought they were going to feel better again, it's, I love it. Thank you so much. 